well, yeah, like, uh, like PJ said, my name is David, and I, I come from Mexico. Uh, you can find me on the uh, internet as David, um, like that on Twitter, on GitHub, or um, almost all social networks. Um, and yeah, I'm here to talk to you about how to process uh, millions of images with Elixir uh, versus Ruby. Uh, it was uh, shortened the title, uh, but I have to, I do have to make a, a warning before starting. This might not be the best way to do it, um, <laughs> but I just want to tell you like this is this is the project that I decided to use uh, to learn Elixir, and I learned a, uh, a few things along the way. So this is uh, this is for you if you're starting or you're undecided whether or not to move to Elixir. This is gonna be this is gonna be a good story. Um, so let's let's start. I work on on uh, an application that's for the real estate market, and it looks something like this, right? So people can go there, and you know you can put your property for rent or for sale, and you can upload pictures uh, for for the properties, right? Like you know, like any regular website do. And if you use, if you're familiar with the Ruby on Rails world. Uh, I'm using a gem that's called CareWave that you know um, creates different versions of the images, uh, like thumbnails and maybe the, the big size or smaller size, and um, and uploads them to S3 to a bucket in in Amazon Web Services, and that's where the images live, right? And every, everything was was going great uh, except for. One day I get a call from the designer and he tells me, hey, you know, we have this, this weird layout here on the homepage. Well, I want to change it. I want to have a map on the right side of the screen. And I'm like, yeah, that's not going to fit. Oh, no, 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 of course it's not going to fit. We need to make these images a little bit smaller. Oh, OK, sure. So I thought to myself, yeah, carry wave. It's, you know, it's easy, so I can just call a method in CareWave, which is called recreate versions with the, with the um, new sizes, and it will all be magic. So I'll just create a rake task that goes through all the images one by one and call that method, right? Um, yeah, that sounded like a good idea except for one thing, and that thing is that each image, since you have to download it from S3, process it, and then re-upload it, took around one second to process each. And when I, you know, I made a query to the database and I had you know, 200, uh, 2, 700, uh, images there. Which uh, for, you know, if you make the math, if you have one second per image, you'd have, you divide it by 60, that will take 45,000 minutes, uh, 750 hours, uh, that total to 31.25 days. And you know, my boss said, "Yeah, no, that's not gonna work. We need it like tomorrow." <laughs> and yeah, that's not gonna work either. But I'll make my best. So I was like, "Oh, okay, right. let's just use threads, right? Because Ruby is so good at threading. I'll <laughs> just do it." And this is sort of what I did. Why are you laughing? It's very good. <laughs> so this is what I did, right? I just created a, 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 a there's there's a queue class in in in. Ruby that's used exactly for this. So I just, you know, pull the images in batches. Um, I created that queue object, um, pushed every one of the image into the queue, and then just uh, have workers, uh, in this case 20, uh, because that's the max uh, number of CPUs that you can get at DigitalOcean. So I said, hey, yeah, a worker per CPU sounds great. And just, you know, started processing images. and. You know, if you know how, yeah. Is that on JRuby or? No, that, that's, that's uh, MRI, sorry. And um, yeah, so weird that you mention it, because if you know how Ruby works, it's something like this. Uh, this is an old slide, but uh, it sort of um, gets you a picture of how it works, right? Like in Ruby 187, there was no like parallelism at all, and then in further version, there came some parallelism, but it's not real because it's not uh, really using taking care of uh, using all the CPUs. And then, yeah, there's implementation like your Ruby and Ruby News that do that, uh, but I didn't sort of wanted to use another version. Um, so the problem is um, the problem with Ruby is that it has a global lock, um, 
any, uh, you know, it, it sounds like um, something that why would they put a lock and in place? But then uh, you come to code like this, uh, I, I made some research, and there's uh, some times where for some reason you have a code like uh, something like this where, where you have an array, right? And, and you can populate that array uh, with objects out of nowhere in different threads. Ruby with its uh, global interpreter lock guarantees that you get the results that you're expecting. So this code uh, running on different versions of Ruby in MRI, you get the 5,000 objects that you'd expect because it's locking every time you're adding to the array and it's not letting uh, any other code modify it before it's done with it. Whereas with JRuby or Rubinus that um, don't lock uh, itself, you get unexpected results, right? So uh, the philosophy is that, um, for Matt's, is that he's taking care of you, right? Like he's, he's making sure that you don't go ahead and do stupid stuff like uh, trying to tangle the code or, or, or data in it. And whereas the other implementations say, no, we're going to give you performance and you are responsible of doing the right thing, like implementing a mutex or whatnot, right? Um, so there's, this, is, this is one of the examples where the, the, the global interpreter lock is in place in Ruby, but there's many more, right? Like there's many more um, uh, functions or, or methods on, on, the, um, on the language that locks you out. So you are not really using uh, parallelism or maybe you're using it, but at some points it will stop you and then continue. So that's why it's not that efficient. But even so, uh, the new version of code that I did with threads uh, reduced the average of processing to 0.6 uh, seconds per image, which is a little bit better, but you know, still 18 days. So Buzz was still not happy at all. So all right, I decided to give Elixir a try. And, and because you know, um, I did not get into the into Go train uh, for some reason. Like I never, I never listened to the people that, that keep telling me like Go is so great, concurrency stuff, and and I didn't get into that train. But Elixir, on the other hand, uh, called my attention because um, it has like a better syntax. I, I I'm a fan of uh, since since I became a Ruby developer, I I am a like a syntax snob, right? Like. The code needs to, to look good, and, and, and I hate like semicolons and all of that stuff that you have in all languages. So Elixir, uh, when I looked at some uh, sample code, it, it, it looked better. So I decided to go with Elixir. Um, and you know, the biggest difference between Ruby and Elixir, and it's that if you have code in Ruby, uh, your code runs in a single process. And when that process, like if you get an exception for some reason, like let's say that I'm running my rake task and for some reason it can't upload to, uh, to Amazon and then there's an exception, then the whole thing dies, right? And I may not notice it. Whereas in Elixir, um, you have a model where you, your process can spawn other uh, smaller processes Right, it's, it, it, it distributes the work between processes and then those processes can make other processes and if one of them dies, then you just replace it with another one. And you know, the, the application continues working perfectly. So it's, a, it's um, better on that aspect, right? So um, I decided to give it a try and let's see what I needed to do. I needed to create an app and an OTP application um, then my app will retrieve records from the database um, and then I will download the original image from Amazon, uh, create the new image sizes with ImageMagick and then upload them back to Amazon S3 like CareWave does for me except there's no CareWave in Elixir so hmm. Um, so the first part creating the app uh, was very simple. You probably all already uh, have created uh, a new app. It's just you know mix new the name of the of the app and it creates the whole tree uh, with the required files and you're done. You're you're ready to to start coding. So that's that's unimportant. Uh, and then here comes uh, the the real code. You need to retrieve records from database. The best way to do it right now that I found is by using Ecto which is sort of like the active record of the Elixir world, except it's not. 
And all I needed to do is just configure it, you know, um, added the adapter and uh, the database name, the username and the password, uh, which of course as root user you don't need a password, and create a model. In the model, uh, it's, it's just a, a module and you use the, the Ecto model um, module and then you define the schema, right? The, the, um, the columns that are supposed to be on your database, it doesn't do it for you except for the ID, I think. And since I only needed the, the file name from the database to create the URL for S3, that's all uh, I added there. So then once you have a model, you can start creating queries. And the queries are created sort of like um, functions. And then you chain those functions to get your results. So let's say that you have a main query, which is just the, um, the main select, everything from this table. And then you can uh, do all things like find, maybe find only one. So you change, you, you chain the main query into, into this other, uh, Query and then maybe you need a page, so you you can add um, the page thing, limit and offset, and and in your code you just sort of use a pipe to change all those functions and get the data that you require. In my case, I only needed to get everything because I was not going to pick the information, so I just create a an all method and just bring them all because I need them needed everything. Uh, then I needed to download the original image from Amazon S3. So that was pretty simple. I just needed something to, to, um, to download via HTTP like, like curl does or uh, wget. Uh, so I found this uh, library that's called HTT Potion in, in Elixir, which can do that for you. And, and it's just a wrapper of another Erlang uh, library, but it works. And, and I needed that. And here's, uh, here's an example of, of something that I love in Elixir, which is the pipe. And, and look at how, how it gets your code. Like, like it makes, makes it look cleaner to me and, and more, more descriptive, right? Um, the, the pipe, what it does is you get the result from the first function and passes over to the second function on, on your pipe list as the first parameter uh, of, the other pipe, of, of the other function. So, I could have written this code like this, you know, where this is the first parameter, but it looks so much nicer when you use the pipe. Once you have like um, four or five functions uh, change, you just start to get the benefits of using the pipe, and it just looks so good. Um, and that will download, like I said, that will download the image from Amazon into, into my local storage, right? So the second, uh, sorry, the next problem that I had is that I needed to create new image sizes. Uh, so I decided to look, uh, figure out how, wha, what uh, I could use for, you know, image magic manipulation or anything, and I found this, uh, this package that's called Mogrify, which is, uh, like it says right there, an Elixir wrapper for image magic um, on the command line. And um, it did what I wanted to do, but it didn't have um, all the tools. So, Here's, a, here's another example of how the, how the pipe looks. This is, this is so awesome. Um, it has methods to resize the images, but if you have used CareWave, there's, there's other methods like resize to fill, resize to fit, resize to, I don't remember the other ones, that give you um, different behavior on how, how it, it, it's the, it does it resizing. So I didn't want it to like, put code uh, in there without knowing exactly what it was doing. So I decided to port um, those methods from CareWave into Mogrify and sent a pull request and got it accepted. So yay me. Um, I love uh, doing open source stuff like that. So now we had uh, these methods uh, for me to use on, on, my, on my own application. Now, the next problem was uploading to Amazon S3, and this is where it got a little bit tricky for me. Um, you know, the first thing that you do when you, do, when you don't know the language is do like Google, how do I upload files to S3 with Elixir? And then I got no results. <laughs> I was, uh-oh, 
What's, what's going on? Like, do Elixir programmers don't use Amazon at all, or what's going on? Um, this, is, this is dramatization, but yeah, I found no results about uploading files uh, to S3 with Elixir. So I was like, all right, that's not going to stop me because I have the command line. And I can use um, Amazon's own tools like S3 uh, CM, CMD, and I'll just make a system call and upload the files through the system and do something like this. So I was done and ran the script and every image, um, I was taking 1.6 seconds per image. Huh. So at that point I was like, um, what's going on? Someone lied to me because, you know, <laughs> this, is, this is not working, right? This, this was me at the moment. <laughs> like, am, I, am I wrong? So I, uh, fortunately, I know people that's experienced with Elixir, and I, you know, I call them and say, hey, your Elixir thing's not working. Like, this, is, this is what's happening to me. I'm doing this, I'm doing that, and it's taking longer, like what's going on? And as I explained to my friend uh, what I was doing, his face went like this, basically. Like, <laughs> Dude, he told me, look at your code. What you're doing right there is that you're opening a... Um, operating system process and then doing your thing and then closing it and then opening, closing for 2.7 million times, that's going to take a lot of time. What you're doing is totally wrong. Uh, and I was like, okay, yeah, I understand what's going on. Yeah, of course, makes sense, right? Open the process, close the process, open the process. That's, that's a lot of work. He told me, well, let's, let's talk about the, the library they're using. S3CMD is a Python library. So why don't you use Airport and open, which is used to connect Erlang to other languages, and open a Python process, and then load the Amazon's code, and use that, uh, that process for the 2.7 million images, and it's only going to be like once, right? And then you'll be, you'll be processing um, like the images way, way faster. And that sounded like a good idea, except I didn't have the time to do that. So at some point when, when, I, was, uh, when I was talking about this, I was like, wait, 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 wait. So I can, you, you're telling me that I can call any Erlang library from Elixir. He was like, yeah, you can just, you know, use the syntax like this, like that, and uh, whatever uh, code that's written in Erlang, it's a library, whatever, you can just call it in Elixir. And I was like, oh, that's, that's interesting. So what I did was went back to Google and Googled, uh, please tell me a way to upload files to S3 using Erlang. And that's where I found it. There's a library to do that in Erlang, not in Elixir yet, but there's something for Erlang. So I was, oh, yeah, I should have started there. So once I found this, it was pretty simple. You just need to uh, add your library to your, uh, to your dependencies and then just call it like this, and you're basically on your way, except for one small thing uh, that I forgot to uh, make it you know, more... Um, clear is that when I found this, I started getting a lot of errors from, from, the, from the call to the, to, the, to the library because it was not, uh, there was no matching of the, of, the, of the arguments that I was sending to, to the function and, and because there was something missing. And the problem was that I was using strings in Elixir and when you call Erlang libraries, you, you most, most of the time you're going to want to send character lists. So I needed to convert that, um, all, of the, all of the arguments into character lists before sending them to Erlang. That's, um, this way I also learned that there's a difference between the, two, uh, the double commas and, and the single ones in Elixir. And it's, you know, I learned it the bad way, basically, because... It, it was just blowing up, and I didn't know what, like, what's going on? It's, it's the right, there's a string, it has what I'm looking for, and, and it still said that it, there was no match. Because I was sending a string, and it was expecting a character list. Hmm. So if you ever use Erlang libraries, you're probably going to need this advice. 
obviously when I when I when I told my friend, he told me he was right there in the example I sent you, and I was like, I didn't read your example. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? So anyway, uh, I can now upload files to Amazon, and I can do it linearly. So what about concurrence, right? Because that was the whole point of this. So if you think about um, what I need to do to process every image, is just retrieve the records from the database, and then download the image from S3, and then create the new image sizes, and then upload the result to S3, those things are sort of unrelated, right? Like I can download, I, I can retrieve the records from the database, and as soon as I get them, I can start downloading um, images, and then as they are being downloaded, another process can start processing them, and then another process can start uploading them. So they're separate things that you can uh, just um, separate into different processes, and that will be like the optimal thing. Uh, I didn't have the time to do that, but at least what I did is um, separate all the, uh, the processing per image on different uh, Erlang processes. So um, the only thing that happens is that I retrieve the records from the database, and then I created um, several processes for the whole thing of, of downloading, processing, and uploading. And for that, I found a tool that's called Pooboy, which is uh, basically that. It's just a worker pool factory. And you use it for cases like this. It's actually, uh, I, w I was actually trying to add it into, into my dependencies, and it was nice that uh, it was already there because uh, apparently Ecto uses it to handle the connections or whatever. So I already had it, and that, that, was, that was cool. So what you do with Pooboy, is that you create a worker model, which um, you know it, it just basically just starts uh, the gen server, and then you put some code that you want to initialize it with every every worker. This is where you put the code that uh, that you don't want to be repeated every time. So in this case, I just initialized uh, the connection to to Amazon. Um, when, when, the, when the worker starts, and then you have the code that actually process uh, whatever, whatever you want to process. So in this case, um, I'm just calling the, the process method that will do everything from downloading the images all the way to upload it again, and then return you know, a reply and, and the result of that, and you keep the state because there's no state uh, per se in, in Elixir classes, so you need to, you know, pass it over uh, through, through the whole life of the, of the worker. And then you need a supervisor, which is the one that's going to be handling, um, that's going to know when, when everything's up and working. And you initialize it. Well, basically, you just need to tell it its name, uh, which I put in another function in case I needed it for, for future reference. And the model that's going to that's gonna handle over, which is the worker that we just saw, and then you can handle the, the size of the queue, which is, uh, it has, uh, it's very flexible, and I found it very, very interesting how, how the pool is work, because you can set a size first of, of, uh, of the queue, let's say that I say 20, and if you start sending work to the queue, then you can set another parameter, which is max overflow, and you can say, hey, if you, if you get a lot of work, then you can grow maybe up to 50 or 100 or whatever. So the 20, the 20 uh, processes that I, that I specify there are always going to be up, but the other ones will only, um, will only exist if the, the 20 is not enough. So your pool, if, if it gets a lot of work, it will grow. And then as soon as it's done, then it shrinks back to, to whatever you want. So, I could have done also, like said, hey, the size is zero. I want, I want the processes to be uh, off, and then max overhaul 20, so it will grow as, as the word requested. And this is, um, this is uh, relevant because maybe you don't want your resources on your server to be spent if they're not being used, right? So you don't want, maybe you want 200 uh, queues, uh, but you don't want them to be up if no, one's, no one is using them. Right, it's because that will waste uh, CPU memory and whatnot. So that's that's pretty powerful in, in terms of flexibility. Uh, you can you can uh, grow and shrink the, the the queue pool, and and it will just do it for you. You don't have to do anything, uh, but but stating it there. Um, then, 
So the main model, the one that starts everything, is it looks like this. So I just start the program and start that supervisor, which is going to handle the queue. Um, then uh, call this method in queue, which is going to just send all the records to the database and, and then to the queue, and just return the supervisor so the, so the process stays up. Um, in queue, what it does, like I said, it just pulls all the records from the database, then goes one by one and creates this, uh, this piece of code is what creates the actual process, soup process that is sent into the queue, and then the queue will manage when to run the process. And just, you know, as soon as it, it will automatically say, hey, I have a process available for you, I will handle it, and then just discard it as soon as it's done. And so it just works basically like magic. So my server just started working like insane. Look at that. It's using all its CPU power to, um, to do all the processing of the images with so little memory used. Like this is this is this is amazing. It's it's so it's great how how Elixir just takes care of it, and it's 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 really the the Erlang virtual machine, but still it's Elixir. What's what's to me it's Elixir. What's doing all the magic? So in conclusion, uh, it took about four days to process the 2.7 million images. You know, uh, it still took some time, but it was way better than the the month that I had forecast with uh, with Ruby. Which, if you if you split, if you do the math to split it, it took like 96 hours, 5,760 minutes, and all those seconds. And if you average it, it took around 0.128 second per uh, per image, which is uh, insanely fast, right? And it's only a problem. Well, it sort of solved my problem because it took me like 12 days to figure it out. <laughs> so, so in total, uh, you know, it, it was like 16, 18 days. So my boss was still not happy. But it was, it was you know, it was quite the learning experience. Um, and the second conclusion will be, uh, this is uh, like Elixir is it's so, so great. And not just because of Elixir, but because you're, you can... Um, use technology that's been there for years in, in, in Erlang, right? Erlang has existed for 25-something uh, years. And, you know, at this point, you'd expect them to do, to, to, for, for the Erlang developers, to have done and solve all the problems in the world. So, so you, you're, not, you're not reinventing the wheel. You're just making it a little bit better with the syntax, and that's, that's cool, right? And, and I know because I, I know uh, people that do uh, Erlang for a living. And now that Elixir is getting hype, and when I talk to them about all the, all the amazing stuff that I can do, they're like, you know, they're, yeah, I've been telling you for years. You're wrong. Erlang is the right, is the right uh, path, right? So, so yeah, they, they were right for, they have been right for 25 years. All these problems that, 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 you, that we are still solving in other languages, like, threading and concurrency, all that, it's already there. It has been there for, 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 for years and years, and it was actually designed for it. You know, you're not patching a language that already existed to handle threads. No, no, no. This uh, Erlang was designed to handle, uh, you know, multiple processes at the same time. So, so you're, uh, when you use Elixir, you're using all that experience in your code, and, and that's great because you're not, it's, it's harder to find um, weird bugs uh, or unexpected behavior, and if you do find it, it's probably because you caused it, right? And like like the whole uh, strings and chars uh, difference, like I did, right? So so um, so this is this is great. There's uh, also a lot to learn, obviously, and and another thing that that makes me excited is that it's a lot to uh, to give. Um, it's uh, the, the, all the libraries in Elixir right now are still you know looking for for help. In terms of, uh, of of code, and I like to do that. Like I, I like to find uh, gems or or um, hex packages that can be improved or that can 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 be better, and just code something and and make a pull request. So for me, that's that's great. It, it's the state of of uh, the current state of Elixir, and to me, it's like there's a lot of opportunities to to give back to the community by you know patching stuff. 
So that's great. Um, the other thing is that the syntax is very, very beautiful. Like I like the syntax. Like I said, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a syntax guy. And, and you know, the, the whole pipeline thing and, 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 and everything makes it look very, very elegant. And, and I really like that. Um, and I guess the other part, which I haven't yet explored, but I will at some point, is that whole airports thing where you can open processes in other languages. Um, I, can, I can at least think, uh, I, I have it on my, on my bucket list to create, what if I could create a server, a web server, that, can, that handles all the, all the connections via Erlang, but then it can open a process uh, of Ruby and just uh, you know, send a request to, to via Rack, and then you know, the web server will be in Erlang, but handling uh, Rails applications, that sounds, that sounds like something that will definitely someone should explore. Um, even if just for a hobby. And that's it. Uh, I hope, I hope you, you guys are really enjoying uh, coding with Elixir like I am. Um, like I said at the beginning, there were probably 10 different ways of doing what I did. Uh, it will have probably been uh, faster if I just refactored the code to use JRuby or Rubiness, but that was not the point. Uh, well, maybe for my boss, it was the point, but not for me. Uh, I decided to do it with Elixir because I wanted to try it out in a real case scenario and, and you know, figuring things out, and, and I did. And so that's, that's how I ended up uh, handling all those images and learning a lot about Ecto, about, you know, threads, concurrency, and all that. So uh, I guess my last piece of advice is if you have a project that you think you can do with, with Elixir, just go ahead and do it and, and learn you some stuff. And that's it. Thanks. <laughs>